Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Time Series Analysis and Forecasting Society. We regularly make public lectures, and this is one of them. And today we have uh, Enno, Bahman, and Stefan. They will talk about their uh, new uh, book. And uh, no further ado, I will hand on uh, to the presenters. And yeah, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Um, welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you so much um, for the invitation. Um, my name is Enno Siemsen, and uh, my co-authors uh, Bahman Rustami Talba and Stefan Kolasa are here as well. Um, we are two academics and, and one person who's more knee-deep in forecasting, so uh, Bahman and I are our faculty at um, uh, business schools in the UK and the United States, and Stefan uh, works for SAP. And um, we uh, let me just kind of um, very briefly tell you a little bit about the history of how we um, we started this book. So I think this started, and, and Bahman, Stefan, feel free to, to join in at any point in time. Um, back in, in 2014, I, I did a lot of um, executive education related to forecasting. And I was a, was a bit um, concerned that we didn't really have a good book that was written for for a managerial audience. There are great technical books out there, but um, you know, so many people and organizations have to deal with forecasts, but not with forecasting per se. So I I always thought we needed a book that is written for the executives that um, you know use forecasts in their decision making much rather than for the professional forecasters that are kind of knee deep in in um you know preparing forecasts and so i i approached stefan and basically said why don't we write such a book and and stefan and i um uh, got together and wrote a book called uh, demand forecasting for managers which has been out since 2016 i believe and um and that was that and uh sometime during the pandemic bachman contacted the two of us and and said you know, this is a really great book, um, but you know, first of all, a lot has happened since 2016 or 2015 when you wrote it, and we need to update it. And second of all, we we should create a free web version um, so it can be more easily used and shared and and so on. And uh, I think Bahman was spot on with that, so we we started working. Um, I think about two years ago or so on a new version of the book. And that's the one you now have in front of you. It's called Demand Forecasting for Executives and Professionals. I think it's really um, an extended version of our original book with plenty of new topics and plenty of revisions. And um, and it's also, of course, and you see the link there, um, free on the web. Um, so this is how we got here. Stefan Bachmann, did I miss anything important? Uh, I don't think there is anything I can add to that. Uh... Uh, I like the way you said that I am needy about forecasting, and I finally understood that you meant knee deep and not needy about forecasting. Yes, I am a little needy about forecasting. Well, it's great to be back here. I already gave one presentation a couple of months ago in about retail forecasting. This time it's about our book. I can't add anything to what Enno said. Uh, Bachmann, over to you. Let's get into the knee deep forecasting. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much, Stefan. And thank you, Rasul, for inviting us. Uh, I'm also delighted to be here. And I, I don't have anything really to add uh, to what Anna actually men mentioned. So we can maybe start with uh, the presentation and what we are going to um, discuss today. Um, so this is the outline of uh, our presentation today. We start with uh, discussing the importance of forecasting and planning and decision making processes and then go through the various steps that we need uh, in forecasting to produce the forecast or the forecasting workflow. Uh, we will then um, show you a simple example of how different sort of um, forecasting could be produced and communicated. <clears throat> Following that, we look at um, the time series data and what we need to know about them, uh, which is uh, important to build a forecasting model and then look at the different components of um, time series that are used typically in classical um, time series forecasting methods. Uh, we then look at um, um, a range of forecasting methods from simple uh, 
uh, to complex and then also discuss uh, how to evaluate the quality of forecasting. Um, we also discuss the ideal forecasters attributes, so the sort of thing we need to have as a as a forecasting in your team. Uh, following that, we discuss the different aspect of organizational aspect of forecasting, and then um, some sort of discussion around different points about why forecasting seems to fail. So it's over to you, Eno. All right, thank you, Bahman. Um... I think I've had so many uh, discussions over the past two decades with um, executives who would basically start off with, why do we even bother with forecasts? They always seem to be wrong. And can't we just do something that we, we don't have to rely on forecasts anymore? And I, you know, my, my very first answer to that is like, good luck. Um, somebody in your organization will have to forecast. Somebody in your supply chains will have to forecast, right? It's, it's almost impossible to do any planning unless you have a forecast. Um, you know, forecasts are key input into any kind of plans, whether it's, you know, capacity plans, production plans, cash flow plans, um, hiring plans, et cetera. All of that needs to be built on a forecast on what happens, you know, in the immediate future, in the long-term future. And and so forecasting, I think, is a, is a very vital function for every organization, whether it's a you know, a retail or a manufacturing organization, a nonprofit organization, um, without a forecast, you're you're kind of blind, right? And and I do recognize how painful forecasting can be. And I also recognize um that I think we've we've come a long way. You know, we have some organizations right now who um you know like Amazon who are built on algorithms and technology and who can deal with a uh, large amount of data very, very quickly. But we also have organizations that, you know, haven't grown up with the same kind of culture and that have struggled for a long time. Um, I just talked with, um, you know, a, a friend of mine who works for what you could call a very traditional classic manufacturing organization. And they've they've only just begun, you know, not basing their plans on the gut feeling of the marketing department, right? So I, I think in terms of, technological sophistication, you have a whole range of, of organizations out there and forecasting needs to work for, for all of them, right? But the important part is the very first step any, any organization needs to realize, um, you need a good forecasting process, right? And you need to uh, constantly improve it. And, um, you know, and, and Stefan Bachmann and I are big fans of saying that actually relatively simple forecasts can, can work amazingly well. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a progression to this. You don't need to start with the um, you know most sophisticated forecasting method right away, right? You have, um, as I think, a lot of benefit in implementing robust and relatively simple forecasting methods before you um, do anything more complex. And and on the plus side, I think there are tremendous benefits to it, right? So um, if you can improve the accuracy of your forecasts, if you can have a more rigorous process of how forecasts are used for decision making um, and how data influences your your day to day activities in the organization, um, you know that usually has huge operational consequences. Meaning, you know, higher service levels, uh, lower safety stock requirements, and overall less friction, less firefighting, happier customers, um, higher sales, etc. So I think there, there are tremendous benefits in forecasting, and I think doing it right is not easy. So developing it as a capability is a is a real competitive advantage for organizations, and a lot of firms are still struggling with their forecasting processes, and in particular, um, their ability to use forecasts effectively for decision making. All right, so the producing forecast uh, to inform uh, decisions is an iterative process that involves several um, repeated steps, as you can see in this uh, flowchart in the right hand side. Um, so the, the forecasting workflow always starts with identifying a decision that requires a forecast. Well, typically, we have one decision or possibly multiple decisions that require. Um, a forecast. So uh, this actually step sometimes is overlooked. So we we are, sometimes you are too enthusiastic to go to data analysis 
and produce a forecast and visualizing them. And we forget about the first fundamental step, which is why we need actually the forecast and how the forecast is going to be used in the decision making and, and planning processes. So um, this is the first thing we need to do. Once we have identified the reasons why we need the forecast, um, basically this reason somehow dictate uh, the forecasting requirements. So the forecasting requirements could include uh, what is the forecast variable, so what, the thing that you forecast uh, or you intend to forecast into the future. Uh, how? Uh, what is the horizon? So how long into the future? How how many periods into the future you want to forecast? What is the frequency? How often you generate the forecast? Um, and and many more. So this is basically the the second step. Uh, once we know uh, what uh, we need to forecast, we have to think about the data, uh, whether data uh, are available or not. So if we don't have any data for it, so it's a, it's a different story. So this flowchart is more actually tailored to the case when we have uh, data. So we need to collect data. And when it comes to data and information, uh, we have four um, different parts that we need to think about. The first type of data that we can uh, collect these historical time series or past data of the variable that you want to forecast. So this is historical time series, basically. The second type of data, we call them deterministic predictors. So these are predictors, they value um, is known in, in advance, like promotions or uh, like public holidays, for instance. We know their value into the future. And the third type of uh, data that we could use, we call them um, stochastic predictors. So these are the predictors, their value are not known in the future. Examples are, for instance, uh, population or weather temperature, even if you find them useful, but depending on how we use them, you may need to produce their forecast to be able to include them in your model. And then finally, we need also to collect the expertise of key personnel in your in our organization that could help us to build a model and sometimes possibly to use to adjust the forecast as well. Um, following this step, we need to prepare data for time series analysis and forecasting. It is actually very rare in practice to get the data in a format that we need for for this task. So here, first of all, we need to put them in the right format, in the time series format. Uh, but also there are other things that we need to check, for instance, for missing values, for uh, duplications. Uh, sometimes you may have a temporal gap in your data that we need to find and fill um, uh, and so on. So here, of course, you also check the quality of your data. Uh, for instance, if, and this is actually the step four and five, somehow uh, we do them together because you can plot your data, visualize them to see if there is a peak, there is a trough, maybe in the time series, um, is this something that you can uh, explain why it is like that? Um, and of course, this is where you need also the, the domain knowledge, uh, without which it is um, almost impossible uh, to build a model that works in practice. Uh, so in step uh, six, we have to decide which forecasting models um, we include in our um, process and this is somehow could be also influenced by what we observe in step five when we visualize the data and typically we consider um, a handful number of forecasting models uh, and following that we have to also train those models estimate their parameters and then in a step five we produce the forecast and use them as a probability distribution uh, or prediction intervals quantile, so we, uh, as, as a single number as a point forecast. And um, then we have to evaluate the quality. And here, of course, there are different dimensions to this. One of them is evaluating forecast accuracy using um, some error metrics, but there might be other sort of um, uh, the quality that we need to look at as well when it comes to the forecast. So these steps are iterative. You may need to go through them multiple times and one, once we are happy with this we can communicate the forecast to the audience so this could be simply you know in a meeting that you produce the forecast and the final forecast and you present it um, in a meeting um, and here also uh, there are two important things that we need to think about 
uh, we need to think about what to forecast, uh, what to communicate in terms of forecasting. For instance, do you communicate just a point forecast or prediction intervals or probability distribution, or maybe even uh, the business value of the forecast rather than just the forecast itself? Um, and also how you communicate those forecasts. And of course, the visualization is, a, is an important aspect to think about here. And um, the final step in the forecasting workflow uh, could be related to uh, uh, adjusting the forecast. Um, so this is a step where uh, you can see whether the forecast that produced or, or the output of the statistical forecast needs to be changed. Um, sometimes you may actually do a lot of changes, but sometimes it is not really necessary. I would say there are two maybe possible reasons that, where you can uh, think about adjusting the forecast. The first reason is if you think there are some like sort of new information that has not been um, uh, captured by the model, and you, you can somehow include those in your judgment and change the forecast. That could be one reason to adjust the forecast. Uh, so another reason, uh, so this is sort of like a new information that just came out. So of course it is not in the model, uh, but sometimes you also feel that uh, there is some information that is not actually captured by the model. And this is something you could possibly include in when you build a model, but for some reason it has not been. And that could be also a reason uh, that you can use to adjust the forecasting there as well. All right, um, thank you, Bahman. I, you know, throughout the book, we we try to keep things very simple, and um, and this is maybe a, a simple example to sort of get us started to think about forecasting, and um, you know, this in, in this case, it's a simple time series, right? And Again, the first thing that I, I show to executives when they say, well, I don't think we, you know, I can't think of forecasting as being anything reliable. I say, just look at the data. I mean, if you just look at something like this, you already know that demand is going to be somewhere between maybe on the lower end, 1,200, and on the higher end, 3,500, right? That in and of itself is a is a forecast, right? It's a describing a probability distribution. And that's, I think, the very first lesson that a lot of executives need to learn. A forecast isn't actually a single number, a precise prediction of what is going to happen. It is um, about, you know, defining a prob and estimating and defining a probability distribution, right? Um, and I think sort of an important part about all forecasting methods, particularly time series methods, is to understand um stability and change right so every you know, uh, you know people will always say well our markets are constantly changing well that should be reflected in your data right and and change in a forecasting um context means it has to be predictable change it cannot be like things that happen in one period but on the next period it has to be something like a, a trend or a a level change where the, the the level of the time series changes and um you know and how much change you have in your in your time series, I think, determines a lot about, you know, the kind of methods that you're using, right? If you have a lot of changes that are happening in your time series, you need to use a method that emphasizes more recent data as opposed to past data. And if you have very little changes in your time series, um, your main goal is to to filter out noise, and you can you can use a basically a, a lot of data to do that, right? So in this case, um, we actually have a time series that is is not changing all that much. There's there's a lot of noise around a level. And so if you forecast it using a, a just a, a simple exponential smoothing model, you're gonna get a number and we, we plotted that over there and you, um, you're gonna start off with a point forecast. And, and here's an important lesson already, like if you plot it like this, one thing that that most people will notice is that, oh, you forecast this time series out for a couple of weeks and you always get the same forecast, right? And and that's, um, you know, that's very counterintuitive for a lot of people to, to realize, right? But really the intuition behind it is, well, if you don't have a trend, if you don't have seasonality, uh, and if you don't use additional causal predictors, um, you're just going for a level forecast. You're just estimating the level of a probability distribution. And uh, and that level doesn't necessarily change. You have no indication that it changes, and that's why forecasts can remain relatively constant over time, right? The, the prediction intervals, and you 
you kind of see this in the graph as well. They change, they become wider um, because the more we, we predict into the future, the less certain we are. Um, but the level doesn't necessarily change if we don't have any indication that there is trend or seasonality, right? And that's it's often counterintuitive for people to understand, right? Forecasts are really filtering out a lot of noise. And, and so if you contrast the level of noise that exists in the time series, it's a lot more than the level of noise that exists in the forecast that you're producing. Um, but again, we get a point forecast. It's relatively constant over time. We get prediction intervals that keep sort of expanding over time. And again, this is, this is another important lesson, right? The point forecast in and of itself is almost meaningless because the exact realization of demand is not gonna be you know, the point forecast. It's very unlikely that you hit the point forecast, right? What is really important is that you that you make a forecast. You make you, you characterize the demand distribution well, so that people understand the range within which demand can happen and how much uncertainty there is. I think a huge managerial problem is um, people resort back to just communicating point forecasts, and that creates sort of this illusion of certainty, right? Um, where you communicate to your to your team members that like this is the number that we're shooting for, right? But nobody really knows how much uncertainty there is around this forecast and for effective decision making you will need to have some measure of that uncertainty whether that is prediction intervals whether that is a standard deviation or a whole predictive density that you're you're describing right and uh, without forecasting becoming inherently stochastic where people are used to um, really talking about not just point forecasts but probability distributions um, you're going to run into a lot of challenges in terms of using forecasts effectively for decision making. Next slide. Wonderful. Um, okay, so, well, the first step in any sort of like data analysis is really, you know, understanding the data and forecasting is not uh, an exception, of course. Um, so it, it is very important to know uh, your data and you know, here we talk about the the time series. Uh, so forecasting, you know, is not is not magic. To build a forecasting that works in practice, it is fundamental to understand uh, your data. And of course, the data visualization or uh, time series visualization would be very helpful in this case. Um, and we recommend using different uh, sort of visualization because each visual visualization could. Uh, uh reveal maybe uh, an aspect of the data that you haven't actually seen before uh, so it, it uh, knowing the data is important for building the model but uh, also it helps you uh, to deal with or identify maybe first the sort of data quality issues that you may have in your data um, and of course uh, following that you need also uh, to fix the, those issues so when you visualize the data you can always uh, if there is any gap, you can obviously see it in your time series plot. If there is a extreme value or maybe an outlier, um, some a value that is very high or very low, uh, of course, those sort of events would always impact the, the forecast quality. So you need to understand actually what happens there. Um, visualizations can also help you to see whether there is any obvious uh, trend or sort of like seasonality. Uh, in your data or not. And I would say, um, of course, you may deal with some time series that are sort of easy to forecast because they, they have a strong uh, trend or seasonalities. Uh, but I would say um, in practice, there are many, many cases, many time series where uh, there are a lot of different events that they affect them. So if you simply you know use the models where they just rely on the trend and seasonality they uh, they may fail actually there because there are a lot of other things that are happening and this is where the domain knowledge becomes really important uh, so if you just you know run models um, on those time series without understanding those possible events or driving factors um, the, it is very hard to get a forecast that could really inform a, a decision um, in your organization. So um, the main knowledge is a fundamental part of the, 
in knowing your data. And actually, this is where later we talk about um, the ideal forecast. And of course, this is a core, core part of like the skills that we need to build a forecasting model that uh, would work actually in the future. So the, the classical time series forecasting models that we have, um, they consider uh, some systematic patterns or signals we may observe in our time series and they use them um, to project actually the, the, the values into the future. Um, some, uh, if you actually do forecasting, so of course you are familiar with this sort of systematic patterns like trend that um, increasing or decreasing uh, or the combination of maybe this in, um, in the time series or seasonality uh, sort of uh, uh, patterns that repeat over a fixed period of time. And depending on the, the time granularity of your time series, you may have uh, one or uh, more than actually one type of seasonality. You may also have the autoregression where the value of your demand depends on the, the past value. So here we talk about the same variable and uh, it dependencies actually to the uh, previous values. You may also have the moving average components. Uh, so this shouldn't be uh, confused with like the moving average method sometimes is used for the smoothing. This is also a component related to the previous sort of errors or um, shocks that you may have in your time series. And whatever is not, uh, you know, these components could be considered as reminder. Um, uh, and a part of reminder, of course, is also uh, randomness. So we may have something uh, that is not basically uh, predictable there as well. So one important uh, thing when it comes to the time series analysis and the components um, is uh, this historical time series. But of course, you may have also the predictors, as I mentioned, in the forecasting workflow that affect the variation in the variable we want to forecast. Um, and it is also important to identify and use these predictors properly in building the forecasting model. Sometimes you may use these uh, predictors or driving factors uh, at the same period, but there are different variations of them that you need also to consider, like leading or lagging uh, values of the predictors, or sometimes the interactions basically between these different predictors could be also um, helpful when it comes to building a model. All right, over to me. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, the the process of forecasting, everything that happens around forecasting. We've heard a little about simple methods and about the components of time series. And now finally, we get to the forecasting methods. As Enno said at the very beginning, this is not supposed to be a technical book that goes deeply into all the forecasting methods that are out there, because there are better books for that. Our book is really aimed to give you an overview, you and others, an overview of what's out there and to essentially prepare the reader to have intelligent conversations with the technical experts and the wizards, uh, some of whom are sitting in this presentation here. All right, so we have put down a very, very simple visualization that uh, kind of arranges the typical classical forecasting methods along two axes of interpretability or comprehensibility and complexity because you start out with very simple methods, and Eno mentioned that one, uh, which is a, the, uh, Eno mentioned that very simple methods can be surprisingly effective, like the historical mean or the naive forecast, where you just take the last observation, forecast that one out, or the seasonal naive forecast. So if you have something, um, monthly data with a strong seasonal component, yearly seasonality, then your seasonal naive forecast would be to just say, I'm going to take last January's observation and use that as a forecast for the next January or for the Januaries after that if you need multi-year forecasts. And that sounds extremely simple, and it is, and that's the good part about it. And that is very, very simple and very easy to understand, and they often work surprisingly well. And especially over the last couple of years when everybody's been talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science, uh, these simple methods uh, tend to get short shrift. 
And that is a pity because very often it's very hard to improve on those simple methods. So what we really very much recommend is to always implement the very simple methods. And once you've got those running, and that's typically a question of a few lines of code, that's when you start looking at the more complex ones. And that's when you think about and actually assess whether the more complex method truly outperform the simple ones because if you can't outperform your simple historical mean with your complex neural network then perhaps investing in a huge pipeline and data scientists and whatever was not the right decision maybe your time series is just best forecasted by a simple method well what we do go into the classical approaches like exponential smoothing and ARIMA. Um, ARIMA, not so much because it produces a wonderful forecast. It's not actually not very good at forecasting, but it's something that everybody learns about. So you need to understand it. I don't know whether that's ever going to die out. We have and then the problematic part about exponential smoothing and plain vanilla ARIMA is that it doesn't really model causal predictors. So if you have predictor information, then the simplest thing you can do is something like linear regression. We'll get onto that. And after that, you start to get fancy. You start looking at tree-based methods, random forests, boosting neural networks, deep learning of various flavors. And there's more and more different variations coming out. And the problem there always is, well, they get more complex. They may get better. It's, it's possible. It's not guaranteed that the complex methods perform better. Uh, what they do get is less comprehensible. And that is very often part and parcel of what we need in a good forecasting method. A forecasting method does not only need to be good in terms of accuracy, but also in terms of uh, being understandable to the user. Because very often, people whose livelihoods and whose job depends on getting accurate and good forecasts, they want to understand the forecast. They don't just want to get a number that they can't understand and they have no, no trust in. They want to have a forecast where they say, I understand what the forecast is coming from. And even if it's not the best forecast, if I understand it, there's going to be more buy-in from me. And that is hugely important because the best forecast will not be used if it is not trusted. And that's why we, especially I, uh, very much emphasize this aspect of comprehensibility and interpretability and explainability. So we're actually coining new words here. And finally, of course, as uh, as we heard in the uh, in that flowchart that Bachman presented, there is always human judgment. There is always human intervention. There's always humans that say, I'm going to improve on this forecast. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. It should always track the human judgmental adjustments and see whether they truly add value or whether they just add noise. And then you have to deal with that. And that goes into the politics of forecasting that we also address in the book. Um, Bachmann, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you very much. Forecast quality evaluation. So how do we know that a forecast is any good? And here, actually, we look mostly at accuracy, and that is a particular hobby horse of mine. Um, and actually, forecast quality is more than just accuracy. Forecast quality encompasses stuff like comprehensibility and so on and so forth. But for this slide, let's stick to forecast accuracy measures. So there is a completely bewildering array of forecast accuracy measures. You can have uh, squared errors, absolute errors, percentage errors for the point forecast. You can have pinball losses if you want the quantile forecast can have interval scores and proper scoring rules, and they get more and more complicated as we go down the bullets, points, and they get less and less comprehensible. Um, Bahman, please click. Thank you. Uh, the problem here is, thank you, wonderful, uh, that some of these error measures may not be doing what you want them to do. And that is most uh, important for the mean absolute percentage error, for instance, one thing that I've been fighting against for years now. Uh, it looks extremely easy to interpret because what else is it than just a percentage of uh, the actual demand? Uh, the error expresses percentage of actual demands. Sounds easy, right? The problem is if you have, um, especially if you have low volume data, a low volume time series or highly variable time series, and actually those two are very close together, these two concepts, then if you want to minimize the MAPE, then you might be very much tempted to output highly biased forecasts. And that is something to keep in mind. And here's just a little example that I put together on cross-validated. So if you want to go and check that one out, the 
the URL is in, in on the slide. Uh, I just simulated some random data and put the uh, probability density next to it. That's this little gray hump there. And then there's uh, three horizontal yellow lines. And what do these three lines represent? Well, they're the optimal forecasts, depending on whether your bonus depends on the mean squared error or the mean absolute error or the mean absolute percentage error. If your bonus is tied to having a good MAP, then you may want to reduce the forecast by a little percentage. And then your forecasts might be biased or more biased than they were before, but your MAPs will be better. And that's part of why forecast accuracy measurement is a little harder than it looks and less trivial than it looks. And it really pays to invest some thoughts in your forecast accuracy measures. One thing that we regularly hear about is external benchmarks. So somebody out there saying the benchmark for forecast accuracy in this industry is 15%. And um, if somebody gets a hold of that publication and then uh, walks to their data scientists and says, look, I just read that the benchmark is 15%. We have 20%. What's wrong? Why are we having forecasts that are worse than the benchmark? Problem there is that external benchmarks, so benchmarks that you take out of the market in some way, they're usually worse than useless because uh, businesses are different. Business face different customers. Businesses have different products. Fast movers are easier to forecast on slow movers. So if you have more fast movers, you'll be more accurate than if you have more slow movers and so on and so forth. And so honestly, uh, external benchmarks that say, this is the benchmark for this industry on that aggregation level. Uh, they're typically highly misleading and uh, make very, very little sense. So what we propose, what we suggest is really not for benchmarking accuracy, but benchmarking processes. Is your forecasting process, uh, refer back to that flow chart that Bachmann discussed, is your process best in breed? Is not Is your accuracy best in breed? Is your process as good as it can be? If your process is as good as it can be, then if you have worse forecasts than your competitor, then it may just be a fact of you're having harder time series to forecast, harder processes, harder services that you provide to forecast. Final bullet point on this little slide here is that, uh, yeah, we started out and I started out with the, with the observation that better forecasts will usually lead to better outcomes usually, the operative word being usually, it's not a necessity. Better forecasts may lead to better outcomes. It's not always guaranteed because your forecasts are just one ingredient in your business decisions that you make. Uh, for instance, if you're replenishing somewhere, then you have to think about batch sizes and you have to think about logistical units. If you always have to fill up the container, uh, then small changes in a forecast will probably not mean that you've start a new container then you always fill up the container whether you forecast three quarters of a container or four fifths of a container it's always you fill up the full container and you're done and so small changes in forecast don't really make a lot of a difference and therefore in the same vein small changes in forecast accuracy may not lead to different business outcomes so they may not even yield any any better decisions later on down the line and so there's always a question of how much do you invest in forecast accuracy improvement? And is it justified by a better bottom line after the forecast and everything else has been taken into account? So always keep in the back of your head when you're chasing that last percentage point of forecast improvement, it's maybe uh, what a data scientist is trained to do and what a data scientist thrives on. It may simply not be uh, the best in terms of business outcome. Bahman, can you click once more? Thank you very much. So here's a little Venn diagram. So because we talked about we talk about all facets of forecasting, and one of our chapters is actually on the care and feeding of forecasters. Uh, so what do you expect, you know, forecaster? If you're a manager and you got that book and you're reading that book on a long flight or medium long flight, it's a short book, and now you're trying to build up your forecasting function. What are you looking for in your forecaster? What's, uh, what do you ask the next person who's interviewing with you for that forecasting job? And there's a uh, there's multiple Venn diagrams out there on the perfect data scientist, and most of them have some combination of statistics knowledge, programming knowledge, and understanding of the business. And, um, 
we like that very much. And we added one fourth bubble to that Venn diagram. As an aside, a four bubble Venn diagram is less trivial to produce than you think about. So uh, it took me a while to build that one. Uh, and that fourth bubble that is hugely important in a forecaster and actually in any data scientist is communication. Because if you're really good at statistics and you're really good at programming and you understand your business and you do, do all the right forecasts, but you can't communicate them to the stakeholders, your forecasts will not be acted upon. You need to communicate them well. And actually, uh, the problem or the, the challenge starts before you do the forecasting. The challenge starts when you start talking to the stakeholders, what kind of forecasts do they need? And to determine those requirements, I'm always going back to that flowchart at the very beginning, determine forecast requirements. What do we need to forecast for? What will the stakeholders do with the forecast that we give them in after we've gone all through, through all of our data science? And to understand what the stakeholders want, you need to communicate to them. You need to understand them. You need to understand their business. That's the right-hand bubble. And you need to understand what they're asking for. And then you may need to there may need to be a meeting of minds between what they would like you to do and what you can do, because very often people have unrealistic, sorry, unrealistic expectations about forecast accuracy. And the data scientist, the forecaster, needs to gently disabuse them of the notion that a perfect forecast is possible or even a forecast uh, of the accuracy that they would like to see. It may simply not be possible. If you're forecasting a fair coin toss, you will not get better than 50% on average. There's simply no way. So there needs to be a two-way communication between the stakeholder and the forecaster. The stakeholders, there might be multiple ones. There may be the business that consumes the forecast and maybe the IT people who need to, uh, to, to administer the hardware or the the pipelines where the forecasts are, where the forecasts come out off at the very end. So honestly, the forecasting unicorn really to put in a little picture at some point in time about the forecasting unicorn. That's a mythical beast that's equally proficient in statistics, programming, business understanding, and communication. And that's yeah, I think that's what you really need to look for in your forecaster. And conversely, if you're a forecaster or a data scientist, those are the four dimensions that you need to develop in. So at some point in time, it doesn't make sense to learn yet another programming language, yet another model. It makes more sense to invest in getting better at communication and understanding the business case that you're forecasting for better. Thank you. Next one. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And I think for the next version of the book, we'll challenge you to come up with a five or six dimensional Venn diagram. How's that? <laughs> um, this is sort of, again, a, a key um, thing to realize is that, you know, forecasting, uh, you know, forecasts are, of course, huge coordination tools, but they, they're usually used across functional barriers, right? So, um, if you think about the processes that forecasts feed into sales and operations planning, for example, these are cross-functional processes. And um, the, the decisions that are impacted by a forecast don't necessarily sit in a single function, but they really reach across the organization. And that makes, um, you know, creates a huge potential for forecasts to become political tools, right? And, and that's, I think, a very, very important part about understanding forecasts in organizations. Um, and I think that there, there are two kinds of things that can creep in. And one is the, the very simple kind of individual biases, and the other one is sort of these political biases, right? And, and individual biases come in the more you ultimately rely on judgment. We had a little bit of a discussion here in the chat room and talked earlier about the importance of human judgment, right? I, I still, you know, most organizations still have sort of the safety valve where um, a forecaster or some other decision maker can simply adjust or override the forecast um, because a lot of contextual information is not properly captured in the statistical forecast. And, uh, you know, and again, that can be an important safety valve, but it also creates the ability to really um, have biases creep in. So uh, some of the typical biases are are anchoring and recency biases where people tend to be much more influenced by recent data in their decision making than than really taking a longer term perspective right and 
Um, as we discussed earlier, right, but paying more attention to recent data makes a lot of sense if you have very unstable time series, if you have markets that are constantly changing, you do need to pay more attention to recent data. Um, but if you don't have you know, highly unstable markets, then paying a lot of attention to recent data is can be very biasing. Um, representativeness is another um, key bias, and I alluded to this earlier, where um, if you ask people to forecast a time series, they will um, basically simulate the time series, right? So they, they will create forecasts that look like the time series. Um, and that is the wrong thing to do because time series contain a lot of noise. Every forecast, the purpose of every forecasting algorithm is essentially to filter out the noise. And, and so, um, you know, people bring that noise back in through forecast adjustments or through their, their judgmental forecasts. Um, people see patterns in randomness, right? So uh, you can you can give people plots of random walks, and I'll, I'll encourage you all to, to try that on yourself. And in about 50% of them, people will see a trend. There's no trend in a random walk, right? It goes up and down at random, uh, but you'll get a couple of, you know, random upward movements that look like a trend and people will immediately spot that as a trend, right? So these are all kind of examples of individual biases that can easily creep back in. Um, but then there are also the organizational biases, right? There's a lot of decisions that depend on the forecast and sometimes it's easier to try to influence the forecast than to try to influence decisions that other people are making, right? So classic example, um, Forecasting used to be, actually, I don't think it's anymore, but it used to be often located in sales functions because people said, well, our salespeople are closest to the market. Let's let them do the forecast, right? And, and it's true that salespeople do have a lot of information about the market, but they also have, you know, highly variable incentives that depend on the forecast. So a classic one is, well, um, if I want the operation side, if I want the manufacturing side to really produce a lot of stuff that, stuff that I can sell, I better inflate the forecast, right? Or if my goals and targets depend on the forecast, right? The forecast often goes into goal setting. Then, well, if I lowball the forecast, I might be able to lower my own goals and targets that I need to complete in order to get my bonus, right? So there can be all kinds of um, different incentives that come into play the moment you think about the forecast as really a, um, a political instrument within the organization. And, and this is a huge organizational challenge, right? The more you can um, keep forecasting technical and have everybody in the organization agree to a, this is what the data says, right? This is the statistical forecast that the that the data points to. Um, you can start having rational discussions on what decisions you, you should make based on that forecast. But the more you can have people influence the forecast it's because they really wanna influence decisions, the less rational decision-making is going to be within organizations. Next slide. All right, so um, I think we can agree that forecasting is a uh, challenging task and it's easy to become frustrated with forecasting. So um, sometimes the forecasting process uh, seems to fail. And here uh, we discuss a couple of points to clarify um, why forecasting seems to fail. And I, I start with maybe this example. So if you have um, used uh, FPP3 book by Rob Heinemann and George Antonopoulos. Uh, you may actually, you may be familiar with this time series plot. This is the time series plot of the demand of tourism in Australia. Uh, and it has a pretty strong um, systematic pattern. So the black line is the actual, and then the blue line is the point forecast and the two prediction intervals and uh, about a thousand different possible futures that uh, are in gray lines actually there and this is the monthly data set then an exponential smoothing state space model is is used to produce the forecast here uh, and of course uh, we know that COVID 19 happens um, and uh, it, it will definitely affect the tourism affect the tourism in, in australia uh, and now if i show you the the actual 
because we have the forecast here, I've, I've shown you actual, um, at least for some of this period, that you see that actually for a part of this, um, the forecast is, is, is pretty good actually for the, it's very close to the accurate and it is within the, the intervals, the prediction intervals there. But after uh, COVID-19, we know that um, uh, the level of tourism is nearly zero there, but the model is still uh, producing a forecast that is very much like what has been observed in the past, right? And of course, this is an extreme case, I would say, of uh, forecasting fails. And of course, actually, in this case, it, it really fails because if you plan your forecast, your, uh, the, the, you know, you have a planning based on the forecast that is produced by this model and you keep, of course, doing um, your activities, then it will be catastrophic. So here we discuss a couple of points. I think we have covered actually a lot of the points, but Stefan and Eno, they have discussed some of the, the points that I'm going actually maybe to highlight here. Uh, but I think one important thing that we need to be aware of is um, decision makers, uh, they make decisions um, with or without the forecast. And of course we recommend uh, relying decisions based on a robust appropriate forecasting workflow. Um, but they, they make decisions based on some sort of expectation, whatever you may call it, but it is a forecast. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is there is no other alternative to forecasting. So if we are making decisions about the future and plan accordingly, um, we have to rely on the, the forecast and there is nothing else that can replace it really in many cases. Um, so, so what is really important to think about when it comes to forecasting as well, um, we need to know what we can forecast um, accurately. And as Stefan said, sometimes, you know, you, uh, if you, um, you know, forecast uh, a, a fair uh, coin test, there is no chance that you can uh, be more accurate than 50%. So here, depending on, you know, um, the, the, the thing that you forecast, if it naturally, it has a lot of randomness or it is less likely that you can get the forecast. Uh, that is very close to the um, uh, to the reality. If you don't have any data for it, again, there may be less chance that you can actually uh, do much better um, than just a simple, a very simple method. If you forecast, you know, um, in, into the future for like years, uh, there is likely that things change a lot in the future. So a lot of uncertainty there as well that you cannot do actually much uh, really there. Um, sometimes the forecast affect itself also that that is important so it will affect the, the accuracy of it so there are a lot of things that you need to think about here uh, when it comes to you know judging whether the forecast actually fails or not another important thing or probably misunderstanding about the forecasting is um, maybe a lot of us see the forecasting as a, just a single number but we know that um, relying or planning based on a single point forecast wouldn't be uh, very useful because this is the most likely outcome. But as um, Eno discussed, there is a probability distribution of the forecast where there are different outcomes with the different uh, probabilities. So we need also to think about it because again, as Stefan mentioned, it is rare that the forecast will match exactly the reality. So we need to think about um, a way that includes also or acknowledged uncertainty in the forecasting as well. Again, uh, we highlighted that you cannot always achieve um, the accuracy you want. There is a limit uh, to improve forecast accuracy. Maybe you have actually reached that limit and um, we need to be aware of that as well. Sometimes it is easy to confuse the forecast with targets, with decisions and, and with plans as well. Um, uh, we know that actually a plan is something that realizes the, the forecast, considering the target, which is again different from a forecast, and also based on a decision that we have already made in the light of the forecast and maybe the target as well. So we need to make sure that we actually don't confuse a forecast with the target decision or a plan. Um, sometimes you may complain about the forecast not being good, but we don't really track the quality. Uh, and uh, well, if we track them, probably we will understand why forecasting, uh, why the forecast was not accurate in a certain point of time. 
um, and maybe we can do something about it. But if you don't really track it, it is less likely that we can do much there. Um, and again, as uh, Stefan highlighted, sometimes you may use an, an inappropriate error measure to evaluate the forecast accuracy. So this is also an important point to, uh, to consider. Uh, well, when it comes to the forecasting workflow, even if you actually go through the forecasting workflow, all the steps, but uh, and you identify the right um, forecast variable with the right horizon and granularity that is relevant to the decision. But if you don't have the uh, relevant data that helps you uh, to um, create a forecast that is going to be useful to inform the decision, um, well, we can't actually do much, even if you know that probably there is a predictor that could be helpful, but if you don't have the data for it, so it is not uh, going to uh, to help. Uh, sometimes you may have actually the data, but its quality uh, is not that good. So again, you cannot really use it in your model. And also, um, again, Stefan and Eno, they mentioned uh, about uh, judgmental intervention. It happens, but sometimes it happens uh, too much, uh, sometimes without really uh, any particular reason. Um, so uh, as, as again, as we, uh, we mentioned, sometimes we are good actually in seeing the rabbit in the cloud without really um, actually having it there. But uh, as a human, we, uh, we tend to, to see this sort of thing and we try to uh, change the forecast too much. And again, this could also result in, in forecasting that may fail as well. And I think that's yeah, the end of our, our presentation.